the biggest takeaway I have from the 2024 election is that wokeism is dead. The messaging that I was seeing, they really were banking on this idea that women are just mm -hmm. dumb. So I know that we can't say, well, anything that happened in this election, you can just extrapolate on what is your take on the overall trends. First time voters now at age 18, they get it when they were in the beginning of high school in the age of COVID. The light bulb is going off much earlier in life. I don't like Isabel Brown, thanks so much for joining the podcast. Thanks so much for having me back, Lila. What an exciting week <laughs> to celebrate the trajectory of our country. Yes, yes. How are you? How are you doing? It sounds like you're feeling good, which is great. I sure am. You know, going into election night a week ago, I wasn't sure anybody could have accurately predicted what the heck was going to happen next. But if anything, I've seen America really come together in the last week or so to realize that we have an opportunity to be a truly United States of America again. And regardless of who you voted for in the last couple of months or were supporting or what political party you belong to, it seems like there's a sort of a new horizon for the future of America and what we're capable of moving forward. All right. So there's a lot to unpack. You're going to help us navigate what happened with the election, how people voted, and then some larger trends. So everyone's talking about this. What does it mean? Which direction is America headed? One of the things I really want to focus on is this liberal women demographic, because traditionally, historically, in recent history anyways, women have voted left. But then yeah. we saw 10% less, I think, Gen Z women. I don't know the number on millennials. You may have that voted less voted for Kamala Harris than for Biden. And Trump actually increased his share of women voting for him. So these are all really significant things. What does it all mean? Lots to unpack. So I, let's maybe start with your general takeaways. Like what, what would be your top takeaways from how you saw the resu election results play out with the young female vote? Great question. And I think just generally speaking to the entire American electorate, the biggest takeaway I have from the 2024 election is that wokeism is dead in America moving forward. The idea that we are going to continue buying into these lies that have replaced truth, not just in politics, mm -hmm. but in every aspect of culture, that men can become women, that women don't even exist, and we can't answer what that question is, that abortion is going to be better for you than building a family, that big pharma has your best interests in mind. All of the things that we've sort of been duped into believing over the last decade or so have been given a death sentence for starting January 20th, 2025, and moving beyond that. So I think the cultural ramifications this election is going to have are going to ripple out for the next several generations, and I'm really excited to see how that plays out. But with what young women in particular, I'm really frustrated to see the narrative that's playing out in the mainstream media after election night, because there's this assumption that women under the age of 30, for example, were overwhelmingly pro Kamala Harris. They were overwhelmingly only voting for abortion on demand through all nine months of pregnancy. They didn't care about anything else that happened to be on the ballot or any other candidate qualification. And that's just not true, nor is it indicative of the trajectory that young women are taking to embrace conservatism across the board, culturally and politically. You were absolutely correct that for women under 30, uh, Biden saw a 34 percentage point lead over uh, Donald Trump in 2020. And we saw an 11 point deficit between Joe Biden and Kamala Harris for this last election for women under 30. So while the media is painting this as some overwhelming majority voting for the left, there is a massive swing going in the other direction. And I made a video about this the other day, but it's not very hard to understand why. When you look at the trajectory that the left wants for women and this utopia that they paint for feminism, you're asking women to celebrate men taking over women's spaces. You're telling women that they should never want to get married in order to smash the patriarchy <laughs> and instead just engage in casual hookup sex their entire life rather than a committed relationship. Mm -hmm. The LA Times recently said it's shameful to want to have children, so you better never want to have that chapter of your life start either. 
and we could keep going example by example, but I think there's a really interesting cultural message that the right and conservatism is offering to young women today. You don't have to be miserable. You don't have to be screaming in your car after this election. You don't have to sign yourself up for a voluntary hysterectomy. You actually have a very bright future ahead of you in a Trump presidency and with conservatism at the helm, which is why we saw that massive shift from 2020 to 2024. It's a really good point, Isabel. I mean, I thought it was particularly striking this 11 percent, this 11 point deficit, like as you call it, between Kamala and Biden, Biden getting 11 points more than Kamala when it comes to the female, the young female vote. And you look at Kamala Harris's entire campaign, which was pandering and using fear mongering, but it was pandering to a younger female vote, basically women of reproductive age claiming that if you don't vote for me, then you're going to not get medical care. Then you're going to be yeah. destroyed because of pro-life laws, all of this stuff. And then even like the ads that the Democrats were running to get women to vote Democrat, like go into the voting booth with your Republican husband and lie to him, tell him that you're voting for Trump and then go instead and vote for Kamala Harris. I mean, they were literally ads in the cycle from the Democrats basically telling women that they should not vote with their husbands and that this is a special, you know, stick out the middle finger to the the patriarchy, I guess. I mean, that was the campaign. Do you think that actually backfired because they tr they, they they tried too hard and people just thought this sounds fake? Hugely backfired for them for a variety of reasons. But the baseline is just because they were banking on the fact that women were just going to be that stupid, that we weren't going to do our own research. We were unbelievably gullible and we would fall for anything they would put in front of our eyes down to ads being put in front of our faces, encouraging us to have, you know, active masturbation to pornography. That was closer to Election Day or the one of the young that was, woman that was bleeding pandering out on to the supposedly the, the male vote, which was so wild and gross. Like if you want to look Correct. at porn, you got to vote for Kamala Harris. I mean, totally disgusting. Disgusting. Not Truly sure who that disgusting. resonated with. <laughs> And that same uh, group that funded that ad then tried to turn to women and say that you're going to bleed out from a miscarriage on the floor of your home and you're going to literally die if Kamala Harris doesn't become the president of the United States. When any woman with two brain cells and the ability to Google any subject on the face of the planet would understand nowhere in America is miscarriage care or care for an ectopic pregnancy illegal, nor will it ever be. In fact, not treating those mm -hmm. situations is in fact illegal. So the messaging that I was seeing, be it paying $10 million, I believe, don't quote me on the exact number, but ballpark to Beyonce to give a five minute speech to try to resonate with young women or giving you an advertisement suggesting you're going to go to prison if you have a miscarriage or you're going to die if you have a miscarriage. They really were banking on this idea that women are just mm. dumb and they're not going to look these things up. They're not going to research them. They'll believe anything we tell them because we happen to share the same genetic Natalia as the potential first female president of the United States. And I honestly was really insulted by that idea. And I think most women under 30, to some extent, were very insulted by that. Now, there was a slight majority that still voted for Kamala Harris. But the fact that millions of people, young women in particular, said, never again am I ever going to support this type of pandering and direct propaganda from someone who thinks they can just buy my vote because of my anatomy, I find wildly encouraging for the next election cycle and the one after that and just the cultural trajectory of our country with these women realizing they can have so much more than what the left presents to them as utopia. So there is a trend generally that women vote left and men are maybe voting a little more right. But even among those that didn't vote for Kamala this cycle, Kamala this cycle but voted for Biden, that didn't necessarily translate and it, you know, it didn't translate for young women to more young women voting Trump than for Kamala. Now, we have to add in the important nuance here that Kamala Harris was, I think, a uniquely bad candidate. And the way she even got, you know, the, the 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 ability to run for president of the United States and be the nominee was insane. Obviously, you know, the, the potential coup was formed against Joe Biden and now she didn't even get any, a single vote and now she's the nominee. And then you could also argue Donald Trump. He has a lot of strengths, but he had some very 
important weaknesses that mattered to a lot of people, including, you know, all of the rape allegations and the Stormy Daniels uh, scandal, you know, paying off Stormy Daniels. And, you know, he's some of the rhetoric that he uses that has been really a turnoff to a lot of women. So those are real dynamics that were also at play. So I know that we can't say, well, anything that happened in this election, you can just extrapolate on trends in general because there were a lot of unique factors at play. That being said, what is your take on the overall trends, especially for young women when it comes to conservative ideals and particularly life and I would say traditional view of marriage and sexuality? I, I'm encouraged by some things. There are also exit polls from the election that were, quite frankly, discouraging because it showed that for those that had abortion, that were in support of abortion, that abortion was a motivating issue for them. Many of them support abortion liberalization, meaning they want more abortion uh, to be legal and less restrictions on abortion. So that's showing people support, you know, pro-choice, the pro-choice side. How do you see the larger trends when it comes to Gen Z and younger women and their political and really cultural beliefs. We Heart Nutrition provides wholesome supplements and vitamins, and they have wholesome values. Not only does We Heart Nutrition use the highest quality research-backed ingredients that are always in the most bioavailable form, We Heart Nutrition is also unapologetically pro-life. In fact, 10% of every sale of their vitamins is given back to pregnancy care centers. You may not know this, but many of the major multivitamin companies are owned by corporations that donate directly to Planned Parenthood. With We Heart Nutrition, it's the opposite. It's not only a best-in-class vitamin, but they're donating 10% of their proceeds back to pro-life resource centers. We Heart Nutrition sells vitamins for women at every age and stage of life, including options for preconception, pregnancy, postpartum, and postmenopause. So go to weheartnutrition.com today, use the code Lila for 20% at checkout. Now, when you place an order of $50 or more at weheartnutrition.com, you will receive a free signature bamboo capsule box. These boxes are adorable and make taking your vitamins or traveling with them easy. Check out weheartnutrition.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 20% off. That's weheartnutrition.com. Yeah, great point on being careful not to extrapolate this election to general political trends that we might see, because it's true, Kamala Harris is a uniquely terrible candidate, the likes of which we've never seen in American history. But I do find it extremely telling, zooming into political voting exit polling mm -hmm. from this election, everyone was predicting for years, really, from the midterms to 2024, leading up to election day that young men were trending overwhelmingly more conservative and young women were trending overwhelmingly more liberal, that we were experiencing a massive divergence and you were going to see that in how people voted come election day. That didn't end up manifesting. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that was because Kamala Harris was a horrible candidate or just because the ideas of the radical authoritarian left, which are not liberal ideas anymore, aren't resonating with Democrat voters, I think we could theorize about that all day long. But that divergence is not really happening. There is a massive convergence of these ideas, even if it's taking women a little bit longer to get there. And I think the reason that it's taking women longer to get to this overwhelming conservative pendulum swing is the cultural impact of all of this. I came out with a book about Gen Z and how we were expected to kind of shock the world when it came to this election in March called The End of the Alphabet. And everyone laughed at me way back when, when I said, you will be shocked at how overwhelmingly conservative, not just politically, but culturally, this generation is as we continue to grow up. Half of Gen Z can't even vote yet, and all of the data about them suggests the younger half of our generation is even more conservative than those of us who can vote. So I have a lot of hope for them. But zooming in on those of us from 18 to about 27 years old today, Kamala Harris only won the youth vote by less than 8%. And that was about a 30% win for Joe Biden in 2020. Wow. Importantly, the majority of young men, over 52%, voted for Donald Trump. And the rest of that tiny, tiny, tiny victory for Kamala Harris came from young women in Generation Z. So the reason for that is a million fold, but really I think comes down to the cultural shift we're seeing play out because of bold individuals operating on the cultural battlefield like yourself and Charlie mm -hmm. Kirk and Brett Cooper and Brandon Tatum and people 
people who are going out of their way to speak directly to Gen Z in a language that we understand. It's why we're not registering for $250,000 degree programs <laughs> to get a woke piece of paper because we know that's not going to be successful. 90% of Gen Z men and women still say that they want to get married someday, even in an overwhelmingly anti-marriage culture. Uh, mm -hmm. That also trends with wanting to have a family, which is overwhelmingly supportive uh, of what the next generation is going to look like, despite everyone saying, don't have kids, it's going to ruin your life. And maybe most importantly, and most towards conservatism culturally, Gen Z is experiencing a massive, massive resurgence of faith right now. The Catholic Church has just reported a huge mm. increase in people signing up for RCIA <laughs> in the last couple of years joining the church. We see these mass baptism events on college campuses and Ohio State football players talking about why their faith is the most important thing to them on podcasts. So I think we're seeing that upstream mm. cultural shift happen, and that's only going to manifest as more conservative politically. Well, you look at the ideologies, like the contest of ideologies, right? The far left ideology and then conservative ideals and which one really ages well, right? I mean, there is this, there is this common sense that the more, you know, as you get older, as you mature, you often become more conservative. You know, once you have your, you get married for the first time, you get your first job. And certainly when you have your first kid, then all of a sudden, all of these, you know, what grandma believes about politics and culture starts to really drive home for you. You're like, oh, this makes sense. Like, yeah, I shouldn't go, uh, you know, having a, a more, more traditional lifestyle actually is nice. You know, it actually helps me raise my kids. It actually helps me have a healthier relationship with my husband or my wife. And I, I think the real world experience that people are having really helps. And that's where the conservative movement has always had that on their side, lived experience. Are there some trends that you're seeing in how people are faring mentally and economically that you think are also driving people to faith and conservatism? Because I know in the last decade, there have been real hard pills to swallow for younger people when it comes to mental health. And then also yeah. e economically, it's it's rough out there. I mean, today, affording a house as a young person feels like an almost impossibility. And even with that yeah. fancy college degree, many people can't afford to move out of their parents' basement and they're you know, under piles of student loan debt. So what are your thoughts on that and how that's impacting the trends? You know, interestingly, I think Gen Z has a leg up on generations older than us because we don't need to wait to have those major life milestones like getting married or having to pay your first massive tax bill to the IRS after starting your first business or having a child. We're really seeing the impact of big government and corruption and authoritarianism at earlier and earlier ages, which is a curse because we've seen how much that's impacted culture for the worse, but also a huge blessing in the long run that I don't think we should take for granted mm -hmm. because kids are being taught in second or third grade that they're probably born in the wrong body and don't go home and tell your mom and dad that. Kids are coming home from school saying that I had to wear a mask all day and I wasn't allowed to ever take it off to hang out with my friends or laugh or have this experience of real in-person connection. And the younger voters in this election, first-time voters now at age 18, really started experiencing the mass problems in humanity in the age of COVID when they were in the beginning of high school. So these are people that have experienced the real world impacts of what happens when leftist authoritarianism takes over at age 14, 13, 14, 15 years old. And so they get it. The light bulb is going off much earlier in life. I don't like being told what to do. I don't like being locked in my room. I don't like being indoctrinated into thinking I'm actually a boy when really I want to celebrate the fact that I'm a girl. And I'm really grateful for that because when these horrible economic situations or mental health crises end up manifesting throughout our entire lifetime, I mean, Gen Z has been the mental mm -hmm. health crisis generation our entire existence, we can recognize where that's coming from. And when things hit a really, really, really low point, I would say probably in 2021, right in the, the era of COVID, for Gen Z, it was a rock bottom wake up light bulb realization for us that we have our destiny in our hands mm -hmm. if we have the courage to seize it. In 2021, one in three teenage girls, according to the CDC, seriously contemplated taking her own life. 33% 
of Generation Z young women because genuinely that was looked at as a better alternative to how our country and our culture were playing out before our very eyes. And it's hard to blame them when it's already tough being a teenage girl, but every piece of messaging and culture was telling you, you don't even need to be a girl anymore. Let's just chop off your body parts and chemically castrate you and you'll feel a lot better Turns out, spoiler alert, that didn't work out very well. Uh, and so I think we're experiencing the need for a turning point and the need to right the ship so much earlier in life that the wake up light bulb moment doesn't need to happen in our late 20s or early 30s. It's happening right now in our teenage, adolescent and young 20s years. So you have the book, uh, I think it's The Anxious Generation by Jonathan Haidt. And his whole theory is that, you know, his whole thesis is that it's the smartphone, it's social media that's making people depressed and suicidal and anxious. And we need to eliminate that for younger people because it's so addictive and it's so fake, that whole world of social media and the phone. And then you have Bad Therapy by Abigail Schreier. And I know you're familiar with her and her theory, her thesis is, well, it's not as much as it is the smartphone, although that does have an impact, but it's actually the way that we are medicalizing common, normal angst that mm -hmm. happens or you know hyperactivity that little boys have when they're young. And then the institutions that we push kids through, especially our school system, and that it's not actually designed for their flourishing. And so they end up getting medicated because they have these behavioral problems. And so we're basically just medicating everything. So what, what do you think? I mean, do you think, I mean, there's, I think truth to both of those theories. What do you think about those theories? And, you know, the reality is a lot of young people who I think are getting red pilled. It's because of media. It's because of social media. They're not learning conservative values in the school system. The school system's pretty dominantly pushing liberal ideologies. So they're getting it from another source. And I would say independent media, your voice, so many of these other powerful voices has an impact. But, you know, Jonathan Haidt would say, well, that's actually leading and increasing the mental health, you know, problems because they're spending too much time online. How do you, what do you yeah. make of all of that? Did you know that every year 200,000 families go bankrupt from medical bills, even with health insurance. For many people, insurance is simply not working for them. That's why I'm excited to share with you about Crowd Health, which is an alternative model for paying for your health care. Crowd Health takes your bills, personally negotiates them on your behalf, and then sends out a request to the community to help cover your bills. The Crowd Health community has fully funded more than 5,000 medical bills over the last two years. This includes accidents like a young woman in Tennessee who lost her fingers in a boating accident, to NICU babies and cancer cases. Keep in mind, crowd health is not the same thing as insurance, but it is an alternative model to help pay medical bills and keep your monthly costs low. So go to join crowd health today. Use the code Lila at checkout to get your first three months for only $99. That's joincrowdhealth.com and use the code Lila at checkout to get your first three months for only $99. Joincrowdhealth.com. I want to come back to social media because I am a bit of a social media apologist. I am biased as a content creator in, in what we can achieve in changing culture. But I do think there's a whole lot of truth to Abigail Schreier's position mm -hmm. here that not to black pill anyone and make you feel doomsday about the whole thing because we're riding the ship in real time mm -hmm. with Donald Trump being elected as president here. There has been this pipeline of destruction uh, that really makes you dependent upon the government, upon our institutions, upon the pharmaceutical industry, et cetera, for the last several mm -hmm. decades in America. And if you go back and you study American history, not from what they teach you in school, but from independent research in the last several years, it's no surprise why the American Communist Party 60 years ago read into the congressional record their goals to take down the United States of America and turn us essentially into to a communist state. And a lot of these goals were to take over the education system, to take over medical uh, facilities, to make sure we disincentivize the growth of the family and try to split families apart. And so everything that you're seeing with kids being put through this pipeline of that's not normal when you want to play outside as a kid and you're now medicated for that for ADHD starting at a very young age, then all of a sudden you start getting bad grades because you're str struggling with your mental health and the school system. That sets you up for increased dependency 
pregnancy moving forward and you watch this pipeline work from childhood to adulthood, I think people for the first time in this election cycle are really waking up to that cycle of dependence and why we desperately need to break it. And we're going to break it in numerous different ways in 2025. I'm incredibly optimistic as a scientist by education myself uh, with RFK's plans to dramatically reform the Food and Drug Administration and the National Institutes of Health because that's going to impact our medical schools, our pharmaceutical industry, uh, how doctor's offices are operating, and so, so, so much more that I don't think people quite are aware of quite yet, but it's going to really be a seismic shift for our country. Getting rid of the Department of Education, believe it or not, is not synonymous with stopping the education of children. It's actually returning real education down to the local and state level rather than creating these pipelines of indoctrination at the federal level we've seen for the last several decades and resurrecting the idea of more personalized education, kind of like a one-room schoolhouse, if you will, <laughs> by incentivizing homeschooling. So there's a lot of opportunities for us to break that cycle. But I do think people were red-pilled, black-pilled, eyes-opened, aware for the first time that that's how bad things have gotten in the last several months. Mm -hmm. On the social media front, of course you can make the argument based on all kinds of peer-reviewed studies that spending too much time on a screen makes you depressed. It's why we all remind people to go touch grass in the content creator community so that you're not constantly perpetually looking at a screen. But I really believe that social media, like anything else, is just a tool at the end of the day. It can be used for very, very good or very, very bad. And there are certainly obstacles in the way of that with algorithm manipulation and shadow banning and mass censorship. But for the most part, if you are committed to navigating that system, you have an opportunity to go so far more viral as one person telling the truth than entire networks with multi-billion dollar budgets. MSNBC, for example, is set to go on sale this week because their ratings are in the absolute tank. And they're only getting about 60,000 viewers per day right now based on their most up-to-date numbers. If I don't get 100,000 views on an Instagram video, I consider that a really, really bad day. Like something is actually wrong with the algorithm and we're reaching you know, 50 million people per month. House in Habit, Jessica Krause, who's amazing, just announced she reached a billion views in the last month on Instagram alone. So Insane. we're watching this shift happen to change people's minds. And I have no doubt in my mind that the work of Charlie Kirk, of Brett Cooper, mm. of Kristen Hawkins, mm. reaching Gen Z on platforms like Instagram and TikTok is probably what saved this election. Mm. Do you think that the uh, traditional legacy media, I mean, look at what happened with Kamala's campaign again. She literally hired... Beyonce, she hired all of these entertainers. She got Taylor Swift's endorsement. I don't know if she hired her, but she did get her endorsement. And yeah. I think they were counting on this to work for them. I think they're counting on this to like move people. And it's like, that's not how people are influenced anymore. No, particularly young women. And nobody's really talking about that in the aftermath of the devastating Kamala Harris campaign theory and strategy of these celebrity endorsements. Not only did they hire them, they paid them tens of millions of dollars thinking that was going to win over young women who worship Taylor Swift and who love listening to Beyonce. Uh, but really in the age of TikTok, especially since 2020, young women are really gravitated towards content creators that are just real people mm. today, that are truly authentic, that sit there with no makeup on, crying in their car on a really bad day or getting ready and putting their outfit on at the beginning of the day, talking about their struggles and what they're overcoming in life and sort of letting you into this personal aspect of who you are rather than the glossy gazillion dollar celebrity airbrushed version of fame that I think the millennial generation generation was quite used to. There's a reason that the biggest influencers on the face of the planet today typically have their hair wet and they're doing get ready with me videos and they're getting tens of millions of followers on these platforms because they're just real people. And I love that about Gen Z. Do you think there are also more Gen Z influencers? I mean, there are, you mentioned a few, but I think there's also this maybe space that they feel they can create or be maybe counter, a counter voice, a contrarian. And so there's more of this opportunity now for people to have the not woke view that everybody has that's so baked in and that actually helps set them apart. And now they have this opportunity to reach more people this way. How much do you think that plays into it? 
Oh, it's it's absolutely massive. It cannot be overstated the importance of the media infrastructure that the right has built on platforms like Instagram and YouTube and TikTok and Facebook over the past several years. You know, everybody used to laugh at conservative content creators, and maybe sometimes it is a bit overwhelmingly political. It's why I've transitioned my content to be more culturally focused in the last several years. But let's not forget, there is no such infrastructure on the left. In this last election cycle, they had to pay celebrity endorsements for millions of dollars or were trying to desperately recruit any content creator under the sun, even if they never talked about politics, offering to pay people like $50,000 just to go to a Kamala Harris rally and post about it, even if you never voted for her or never have any sort of allegiance to the Democrat Party. And amazingly, TikTok influencers ended up sharing these stories to be transparent and authentic with their audience. But there isn't that sense of a movement mm -hmm. with young liberals and young Democrats, I think just because it's not that cool, right? Yeah. It's not edgy or punk rock to be a young liberal. Liberals <laughs> own the entire media infrastructure from and, Hollywood and entertainment and you're also to the news. And you're also a perpetual victim, which gets really exhausting eventually. I think that's yeah. you mentioned at the beginning, you know, wokeism is dead. And I think you know, wokeism can be incredibly powerful for the first go of it. It's like, okay, we're victims and everybody, this is an institutional, you know, oppression. And there's this sort of, you know, the oppression Olympics happening. And there are these horrible bigoted peoples or in infrastructures that are hurting us. And you can kind of like do that and like scream about it for a little while. And then after doing that for a year, two years, three years, five years, you're burnt out. You're really burnt out oh, because yeah. you haven't persuaded everyone to believe you're a victim. And then the ones that you have persuaded, you're still a victim. Like there's no hero's arc for you to like not be a victim anymore. Cause if you're not a victim anymore, then you lose your audience, you lose your whole platform. So it just, it's exhausting. And I think a lot of people, including content creators to be the victim perpetually in their content or like to have the victim narrative be the driving force of their content. It's not fun. It's not entertaining. Mm -hmm. It doesn't last a long time. And so I've actually seen a lot of content creators alongside becoming conservative and, you know, embracing traditional values. They're also just not doing it. You know, they're not, they're not going to go. You had a lot of content creators that maybe in another generation, they would have come out for the Democrat candidate or they would have been more confident talking about how they're liberal. And now it's like not fun or cool to be liberal. And so if maybe if they are deep down, they're not sharing it because they don't they know it's not really going to buy them brownie points with their following necessarily. And so we're actually we see this crazy movement of this disincentivizing of liberal content creators including young ones, to make liberalism part of their content. And I think that's really going to bode well for future <laughs> you know, generations because now you're, it's less cool to be far left. And what a victory. Honestly, it's cringy. It's it's cringy to be far left. And the few content creators, especially within Gen Z, mm -hmm. that are these overwhelming liberal Democrat apologists, they're memes now. Like we make fun of them every mm -hmm. single day on the internet because it's hysterically pathetic how much you're trying to pander to the left instead of just taking ownership for your life. There was only a few names really that came to the surface for young liberal influencers this last election cycle, mostly men, which I found really interesting. Harry Sisson and you saw Dean and all the all these young people trying to say, oh, it's cool to be a young liberal. And yet they were constantly made fun of all over social media for the last six months. And the biggest opportunity I see to continue shifting the minds of young women in the wake of this election has also come from social media with the very few but very, very loud number of mostly millennial women who are now embracing the 4B movement after Donald Trump has won this election, which originated in South Korea. Uh, and it originates from a Korean word is where the letter B comes from. But basically, the four pillars are we're not going to have sex with men anymore. We're not romantically dating men anymore. We will not get married to men and we will not have children with men. So essentially, we'll just be voluntarily celibate, which kind of was the whole point the entire time, believe it or not. Like, if you don't want to get pregnant, just don't have sex. <laughs> Bingo. Fascinating information. But these women are going ballistic, shaving their heads on TikTok and scheduling themselves for voluntary hysterectomies, divorcing their husbands of like 10, 20 years. And Gen Z women are looking at this and crying, laughing as a joke because they're there's no way people are this deranged or bought into these narratives 
narratives are constantly poisoned by the propaganda of the media. And the fact that I see so many people reacting to this in laughter and humor and saying, that's ridiculous, I have no idea what you're doing, gives me so much hope for young women. It's been long debated at Thanksgiving. Is turkey better or ham? If you picked either, you'd be wrong. Because the third and correct option is a free ham from Good Ranchers worth $110. During Good Ranchers Thanksgiving special, you can choose any box of their 100% American meat and wild-caught seafood and get a free 10 pound spiral cut ham added to it for free. What I love about Good Ranchers is that it is 100% sourced from the United States. And when you choose GoodRanchers.com, you're choosing more than just delicious meat. You're choosing to support local American farms and ranches and standing up for transparency and safety in our food supply. No need to waste time in long lines at the grocery store since Good Ranchers is delivering high quality, 100% American meat straight to your door. You can celebrate what matters most this Thanksgiving time with the people that you love. To claim your free Thanksgiving ham before they're gone, go to GoodRanchers.com, subscribe to any of their boxes of 100% American beef, chicken, pork, or wild-caught seafood, and use my code LILA at checkout. Be sure to order by November 19th for guaranteed delivery by Thanksgiving. Enjoy your ham. Yeah, it does. It it makes me sad, too, for those women because what a miserable way to live. But my hope is, as again real life experience, lived experience has that way of helping people wake up to common sense. You know, the consequences of your actions do play out in real life. And then you have to deal with those consequences that might make you rethink the way you're living your life. My hope is that those women, and again, I don't know how many of those women there are. I know like it was a big viral thing in the last week, the whole 4B movement and one TikTok video of one very unhappy woman can go viral and make it seem like there's millions of these women out there. I think it's a pretty small group of them. And I think they're, they're further sidelining themselves. Like they're further moving themselves out of a place of any kind of meaningful cultural influence and any kind of meaningful, I think, future political influence because the future I think belongs to the people that are doing the work, not just of content creation and education, and all of that, but most importantly, doing the work of creating new institutions and raising families. I mean, the future belongs yeah. to children. Who, who is raising those kids? And if you have 10 of them and you're maybe homeschooling them or they're going to that classical, you know, Christian Catholic Academy and they're really being trained in, uh, you know, an understanding of Western civilization and what makes us great and justice and all of these things, that's going to make a huge impact not felt today, but felt 10, 20, 30 years from now. So I'm so excited because the things you're talking about, the trends that we are seeing today, they're going to grow, I think, exponentially as years go by because the people doing the hard work today of building the schools, building the new businesses, getting out of bed in the morning, raising the family, those are the people to whom the future belongs. And those are good people. Those are good people doing that stuff. If you just do the basic math, everybody's been reporting in the last week or so that liberal women are swearing off sex because they're so terrified if they become pregnant, they will literally die in Trump's America. But young conservative women are probably going to experience the next baby boom, which I find fascinating because the reason baby boomers are even called that as a generation was because America was in such a period of prosperity that everyone wanted to share that with a new generation. And I think that is exactly what's happening come 2025 and beyond. So mathematically, I have some really good feelings about the makeup and demographics of the future with these young conservative families coming to fruition. And I think the same will continue to manifest even in these very controversial issues that people didn't see a lot of hope for. For example, abortion. You know, everybody was believing to the bone that young women in America today would all unanimously vote to support Kamala Harris's radical abortion agenda or any abortion ballot initiative across the country. And you saw some states shy away from talking about that and telling the truth, even when it's difficult to hear. And that ended up backfiring. Look at Arizona, for example, where Donald Trump did secure the Electoral College votes there in Arizona. Uh, But overwhelmingly, they voted to enshrine late term abortion in their state's constitution and state laws. Uh, But contrast that with states like Florida and Nebraska and South Dakota. I live in Florida now. I moved here about a year and a half ago. And every Everyone was convinced Amendment 4 was going to pass with flying colors. Every commercial on TV at the gym, every time there was a sports game on, every bumper sticker, everything everywhere was Amendment 4, Amendment 4, uh, which for, if you're not familiar or you're not from Florida, essentially would have constitutionally enshrined late-term abortion 
in our state. Mm -hmm. It failed. And it failed because people were bold enough to do the hard work, to say the hard thing, to speak the truth in love up to our governor's mansion where Ron DeSantis was willing to say, you know, this just isn't what we do. If we want a better future, if we want to support families, this isn't who we are. And therefore, you saw those amendments fail. You saw people protect life. And I think these controversial ideas are just like the controversy of wanting to get married and have a family to begin with in a t culture and trend where that's not necessarily the hot thing to do right now. But when people are willing to stand up and do the right thing, courage is contagious. Yeah, I mean, in Florida, they literally lit $120 million on fire. That, that's what the pro-abortion side spent. Quite literally. $120 Which ironically could have been used to fund free prenatal care. I don't know. Just putting that sad out there. Sad thought. But, yeah. Sad thought, Isabel. And same with Missouri. Yeah. I mean, they won by two percentage points in Missouri, the, the pro-abortion side. So that was a horrible, horrible loss by the pro-life side. But they outspent the pro-life side over 10 to 1. So you see these crazy amounts of money that the abortion side has to spend. I mean, that was Kamala Harris's campaign, right? Let's spend a crazy, I think she spent a billion dollars to try to get yep. the presidency. She failed. She lit a billion dollars on fire. And the strategies that they're employing, they might work in a few percentage points like they, they did work in Missouri. That's a heartbreak. We got to fight to take back that lost ground. That is a reality. But the amount that they're winning by is a few percentage points. And they're winning that with tens of millions of dollars more than their opposition than the pro-life side is spending. So I think that's actually a really important part of interpreting those losses and those wins because we won in Florida spending, it was less than $20 million and the pro-abortion side spent over $100 million. So that that is all tells me that people don't love killing babies. <laughs> they don't love abortion as much as the media is telling them to. They just don't. I mean, it's not as baked in, thankfully, as it might be. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you about, Isabel, was just this administration and your your sense of it, because obviously, you know, and I think many of us have were, were upset about this. This is a problem. President Trump, he took pro-life out of the Republican Party platform. A lot of people say, well, that doesn't matter. The platform, no one reads it anyways, but it does impact the posture of politicians, not just at the federal level, mm -hmm. but down ticket. And then President Trump won on this, you know, semi-pro-choice campaign. I mean, he said, I support abortion in these cases and I'm not going to, you know, touch abortion restrictions in this way. And so that was part of his campaign. And then you have some of the folks that may be really strong in other areas who he's surrounding himself with, like RFK, you mentioned, like Tulsi Gabbard, again, very talented people, but you see their support of abortion and their support, you know, of, you know, gay marriage, LBGTQ causes, you see that more than your, your historical traditional conservative or Republican. I mean, they're not conservatives, right? Now, I think having yeah. a big coalition in order to bring unity back, there's value to that, but we can't compromise on these crucial social issues that impact the future of children and generations. I am hopeful that, again, the groundswell is increasingly conservative, but those are real things to navigate with this administration and with the future of Republican politics, right? So what is your view on all of that? And what do you think the role is of content creators in an era of Trump where there's a lot of opportunity, there's a lot of hope, but there are also these challenges that we're facing? I certainly was not quiet about my moments of disappointment mm -hmm. throughout the Trump campaign this time around when it came to compromising on these really important issues. I spoke very candidly about IVF and uh, abortion policy and everything in between. And so I think it's important that we continue doing the work to tell the truth on these things. That being said, I think in this election, there was a really interesting conversation happening inside of the pro-life movement, which generally is a bit of a bubble. And I know we live in that <laughs> bubble and we talk in that <laughs> bubble every day, but it's not generally where the heads of everyone else in our country is at. But I was hearing a whole lot of people say they felt more comfortable sitting this election <laughs> out because they didn't feel like there was a true pro-life candidate on the ballot. And that's really the only yeah. issue that they care about. And we were at risk of losing millions upon millions of votes, uh, particularly from inside of the church, which I found fascinating. As we know, obviously, it ended up working out great that Donald Trump won this election. And I think that's going to lead to a whole lot of pro-life wins mm -hmm. across the country, even if that's not a hallmark policy of his particular administration this time around. I mean, Donald Trump was never particularly a massive pro-life champion, even in 2016, but he did create the pathway and is directly responsible for the pathway to the biggest pro-life win in 50 years in our country in which tens of thousands of babies are saved every 
single day because Roe v. Wade was able to be overturned. Bad constitutional law was thrown in the trash, the the trash pile of history there, which I'm incredibly grateful for. So I do think there's opportunities from a policy perspective to partner with people who don't necessarily share your exact worldview on your deepest held personal convictions, whether those be uh, secular or religious or anything in between. I obviously have my religious background from the Catholic Church, form all of my particular political agendas and policies that I hold near and dear to my heart. But I'm looking forward to this coalition government being able to pave pathways for those wins to happen. Mm -hmm. Had Kamala Harris been elected president of the United States, our country probably would have institutionalized late-term abortion at the federal level, and we would be having a much, much different conversation today. So I'll take a win where I can get it. But this speaks really huge volumes to the role of independent content creators in particular because of what I do every day, and that's zooming out from politics. Yes, letting people fight in the arena of Capitol Hill and the Oval Office and everywhere that that counts. But zooming out to the cultural level, because as we know from the late great Andrew Breitbart, politics is downstream from culture. And if you can change people's day to day lives and their most deeply held values and their personal relationships and how that impacts how they wake up every day, all of a sudden you're going to see that manifest in 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road in Washington, D.C. with legislation, with executive orders and with who is running for president of the United States or any other position to begin with. So mm -hmm. I think it's important we continue the fight to make abortion illegal in America. And I will keep waving that flag as high as I possibly can. But I also want us to take this opportunity to back up and make abortion unthinkable in America culturally, because if we can start there, that will manifest in unapologetically pro-life candidates being willing to say the hard thing and do what's right. Amen to that. And that's the daily work, right? <laughs> that is the that is the daily project. Isabel, thank you for all that you're doing and being such a powerful voice. Keep it up. You're crushing it. Thank you so much for having me, Lila. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest religious network reaching millions of people with the truth of the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.